Welcome to Pune. I'm Dr. A.G. Unnikrishnan and talking to you from the Chalaram Hospital Diabetes Care and Multi-Speciality. Today, I'm going to take you on a trip around Pune with Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, uh, my close friend, colleague and leading diabetologist of the city. And I welcome you all to see the sights and sounds of the city. Everything. Good, how are you doing? Yeah? And how is the pandemic Sigamta treating Jaisa. you? Wonderful. I mean, I haven't had too many problems. Luckily, I mean, how have you been? I heard you had a problem and you just got out of it. Yeah, yeah, I've just made a good recovery. And I think, uh, you know, what I find is that uh, it's good to be back. And I feel that patients are also, you know, uh, you know after COVID, do, do you think, have you seen this high sugars after COVID kind of thing? People we have been back. seeing it, so I mean, a lot of people who have had a mild disease didn't show any terrible change as such. But moderate and severe disease, you know, those are the guys whom we've had struggle with. Good people in the sense, good control have worsened. People have got hospitalized, have suddenly developed a spike in sugars, treatment related, yeah. disease related. And then it's been a struggle because obviously we've had those insulinized a lot of them or most of them for that matter, and trying to get them in control. Yes. So that's been huge challenges. And uh, post-COVID also, we've had a lot of you know, people going up and down because they don't eat adequately and you're insulinizing them. Sometimes they do eat. So you get too much of variability in the sugars happening. And we have to keep counseling them to eat, otherwise they'll go into a hypo because they just lose their appetite and they feel terribly weak. And uh, so it's a challenge all along when you have diabetes and you have COVID. I don't know, how is it the experience with you, Biam? You run such a big institute and, and I think you did have patients with COVID in your yes, hospital, right? Yes, we did have patients with COVID and I also found that, uh, number one, after the COVID, people with well-controlled diabetes really worsened after COVID because, I don't know if it's because of the stress or steroids or whatever, and uh, I haven't frankly seen that many cases of new onset diabetes after COVID. I don't know, when I look at those uh, uh, patients very carefully, I find that their HP1Cs were a little borderline earlier, say 6.3 or 6.4 and then coming up. The other thing I noticed is that people during the pandemic, even if they don't have, uh, say, COVID, during the pandemic, maybe because of the sedentary life, maybe because they're not able to go out and exercise, uh, maybe because they're working from home, but that itself, or the stress, that itself has spiked up the sugars. So I think these are some of the issues. One is new onset diabetes after the pandemic. Second is worsening of blood glucose during COVID. And second is the very fact that they are in a pandemic. And uh, I think these are all factors uh, of worsening diabetes. And uh, now, of course, it's delightful to be out here in the open in front of the glorious uh, Shanivar <laughs> Vada. Uh, it's good. I had a little I bit of pohe. The weather is lovely. I mean, overall, the weather has been incredible, you know, when we have... Uh, Sort of, uh, this Pune is amazing when it comes to just enjoying the morning. You go and have, like we just had pohe and tea and, you know, walking along the roads. It's, it's nice and traditional and lovely climate that, you know, you can enjoy over here. Right now, a lot of focus has been on nutrition and yes. weight and stuff like that. And uh, now, if you notice, there's a whole bit of 
can diabetes be treated more through diet, exercise, nutrition, and you know, weight management, and all those things. And uh, you now find so much of activities happening. And given the fact that now with you know GLP ones finding a big role to play in our treatments, how do you really uh, balance this out? I mean, uh, do you, when a patient comes to you in your practice, yeah. right? I mean, all of us write meds. That's a different story altogether. But how much time in your practice do you dedicate telling them about you know nutrition, weight management, and the kind of food they should eat, and how it influences your sugar, you know, all those things. You know. And I'm sure you've got a great team of people who help you with do that. Yes. But I'm talking reference to the people who don't have such elaborate yes. teams, you know, who how they should balance it up. So I feel that uh, there is a felt need from the patient to optimize nutrition and exercise and that's a good thing. So uh, me as a doctor, I always tell my patients uh, about the importance of uh, nutrition, diet, exercise. I do tell them that for patients coming and saying I want to cure my diabetes without the medicines, I say that may not be possible in everybody. But one thing I do realize is that if you look at just one aspect of it, that is postprandial hyperglycemia, the start study which was done in India was a study which showed that the carbohydrate uh, as a uh, proportion of the energy that we consume, percentage of the energy that we consume, carbohydrates account for almost 64% of the energy. So that's one area where I think uh, we can do more to inform the patients because cutting down the carbohydrate content I'm not, of course, talking about keto diet or low-carb diet, but just cutting down the carb content may help people to improve their postprandial hyperglycemia. And that improvement in postprandial hyperglycemia may actually reduce A1C, for one. And second, postprandial hyperglycemia is associated with dyslipidemia and oxidative stress also. What is your opinion on this Mohniya's data, you know, this very nice... So I think, you know, yeah. that we've had always that how much percentage of contribution of A1C comes yeah. from the postprandial and the fasting. But I think in our set of population, no matter whatever A1C that you really look at, uh, still a substantial part of it comes from the postprandial. I mean, it's, if you have to relook the same data in our own set of population, I don't think you would find so much of a correlation yeah, as such. And I think it will be worthwhile to try and uh, see that, you know, can we do it? What would be the exact... Yeah contributions in our set of population because we find that most of our people that tend to have more of a postprandial hyperglycemia we consume a lot of carbohydrates and that of course influences the sugar so you take from the entire spectrum of A1Cs from low to high A1C still I don't think just targeting fasting is going to be good enough for our population we still need to address postprandial in a very major way and we have enough of data to show that and uh, I think for us, of course, target the fasting, but simultaneously we start targeting also the post panel. I don't know what do you feel about the same. I completely agree because at they say that at lower levels of A1C, it's a post prandial that contributes to HP1C, and at higher levels of HP1C, it's both the fasting and the post prandial. So whichever one we take, I think the post prandial is a contributor. So maybe targeting that post prandial and majority of the time, our Indian population is in the post prandial state. Somebody has breakfast, then they have a mid-morning snack, then they have lunch, then they have an evening snack, then they have a dinner, maybe have a bedtime snack. So sometimes when people are on sulfonylureas and insulin, it's probably also a necessity. But I think that because of the, that factor of majority of the life of people being spent in the postprandial state, maybe the postprandial and the postabsorptive hyperglycemia is something uh, worth targeting so that we bring the A1C down and reduce the risk of complications. But it's all very fascinating. And uh, I think there's a lot of research to be done. So if I have to ask you a question, all right, like somebody comes to you with high yeah. A1Cs, right, and uh, you want to plan a therapy for this patient, right, would you kind of be comfortable only targeting the fasting initially? Let's say I'm, I'm taking another set of problems, right? People are going to be targeted only with insulin therapy. They've come with an A1C, let's yeah. say 13 or so, right? And you say, okay, start targeting your fasting sugars and you titrate your basal insulins accordingly. Would you simultaneously also start addressing the major meal of the day 
you know, with whatever you use yes, insulin, yes, yes. whether you want to use agents which will address the postprandial hypoglycemia, or are you going to be comfortable just getting the fasting down? So I completely get your point. So I was also earlier, uh, you know, thinking that bringing down that fasting and fixing that fasting is enough. And of course, we need diet and exercise. But I think what happens is if you just fix the fasting, <clears throat> sometimes we might end up with a situation where the fasting is say 110 and the postprandial is 300, 400. So I've started adding a bolus insulin with the major meal of the day or adding simple drugs which target the postprandial blood sugar levels or even telling the identifying the big meal of the day and telling the patient to just cut down that big meal so that you can bring it down. So I, I completely take your point that it's not only fixing the fasting, you need to fix the postprandial and identifying the largest meal of the day as an important role to play. Well, is it possible in all patients to uh, get everything right? No, but I think a good proportion with simultaneously adjusting the fasting and the postprandial will get better. And of course, you can always take off, once you fix the fasting, you feel the postprandial really coming down. Then you can take off that uh, particular drug. Absolutely. You post so I think so. you would get a much better control yes. if you're addressing the postprandial. Now, I generally would probably wait it out introducing medicines immediately. I would try and see that how I can get my nutritionist to work with them and modify their diets and give them a little time with the diets before I introduce them onto agents that would help the postprandial. Yes. And address them about their post meal and you know all those things. But I simultaneously begin my talk with that. You know, I said you have to talk about. It. A lot of talks about where, what we've been doing. So I think let's sum up some thoughts as to what we feel about, you know, postprandial hyperglycemia. And there's certain aspects of it we have really not spoken about. The determinants of postprandial hyperglycemia, one, or how does postprandial affect, you know, complications? And we've had a lot of data to that effect. So what do you have ideas about this? So some of the determinants of postprandial hyperglycemia. I think the, car, the, the diet and the carbs in the diet is one important determinant. Second is of course insulin resistance which prevents the glucose from being uh, you know, utilized by the body. These are two important determinants. And I also feel that the higher the postprandial blood glucose itself is a higher blood glucose than the fasting. So it is likely that it has an effect on both micro and macrovascular complications. The studies have shown that it increases oxidant stress and also that it increases postprandial dyslipidemia, it's associated and may increase cardiovascular disease. So I think that's the importance of treating it. There was a Hoon study, the Honolulu Heart study, the Decord study. All these studies showed, in fact, the Honolulu study showed that the one hour postprandial is the more important predictor. And the Hoon study also showed that the postprandial is an important predictor. Uh, uh, for cardiovascular disease and of course we know the HPA1C is. So all these studies give us the evidence and of course the role of diet we mentioned, physical activity we mentioned but sir what is your view on the medications that could be used for yeah, post That is an area that we really need to talk about because for an ordinary, you know, for a person who wants to treat patients with postprandial hyperglycemia, they should have the choice of drugs that, so if somebody comes to me and with a postprandial hyperglycemia, and I want to target postprandial hyperglycemia. So some of the agents that I would use is an alpha glucosidase inhibitors, glanides. You know, they are very good. And now you get, of course, combinations of glanides and alpha glucosidase inhibitors that we really look at. I don't use too much of actual SUs for that matter, just to target only postprandial hyperglycemia. We know that incretins are another group of drugs that will tend to target postprandial hyperglycemia or where you find that they're too high or sugars. I would also go along with giving them bolus insulins. Of course, on the background of giving basal insulin, 
along with that a bowl of insulin if i find that that's really helping to bring the a1c down so these are some of the things that i would really look at and of course uh, coupled with the fact that you need to target their diet and exercise and weight loss and the lifestyle measures so these have to be of course diet modification is extremely important other things that we do have is you know for example uh, binders carbohydrate binders that you may give one hour before yes. the meals and you can use those binders where you know it does help to sort of prevent or retard the absorption of carbs and to a certain extent helps to prevent the absorption and brings down the spikes of post panel glucose so this is some of the ways i don't know you have any other thoughts about oh, absolutely the same the glp ones incredens uh, dpp fours uh, uh, the shield tools all have their role to play but i think ultimately it's personalizing and uh, uh, choosing the right uh, uh, treatment for the patient and uh, that comes to individualizing protocols so that note i think we will go ahead and uh, Now, of course, we aggressively started monitoring our patients with CGMs, and a lot of our patients now move on to CGM monitoring because we have kind of, you know, of course, importance of uh, point of care testing cannot be underestimated in any way or even see. But I think the role of CGMs is expanding now to understand the glucose variability and where you should target your treatments, the time and range. and uh, how we can improve on this so that you get a overall good control of blood sugars right? so how much importance you really lay stress on when it comes to you know time in range glucose variability and things like that i think the uh, the role of technology in uh, postprandial hyperglycemia is something that could be really you know looked into in great detail because if i just look at a patient with diabetes and having a cgm device which is giving a real time glucose it's like a moving selfie of their blood glucose levels in some ways when we take a selfie of ourselves uh, you know people will do anything for a selfie for example i'm standing here i might like to take a selfie and i might just fall off but people will still take that risk but during the time of the selfie they look happy wonderful excited but if you take a moving selfie of their emotions throughout the day they may be sad dejected angry upset so many emotions so similarly if you just take a single glucometer test after a particular meal it may be low or high but when the patient is able to see his or her own glucose levels on a real time basis it's very empowering because it's like a moving selfie of glucose control so naturally the person with diabetes is able to choose the foods that they like which do not increase their blood glucose levels to the extent possible for example person a may eat a particular food and his or her blood glucose levels may rise at the same time person b may take the same food and their blood glucose levels may not rise it could be complex issues such as stress insulin resistance how the gut microbes process the food so i think that is something very important coming up and we as doctors can also interpret the time in range and what do you feel about that the time in range and the time delay i think it's been range. a big shift in monitoring because earlier i think most of us were happy looking at you know smbg charts to see how good our control and very often people weren't doing multiple reading uh, if you I, that's how i explain my patient that if you're doing only a, a fasting and a single point post lunch or post you know dinner or post breakfast cannot determine your glucose status or a glycemic status of the entire day you need multiple readings to tell you that story and the gaps in between are something we are blinded to as to what is happening you know in that sense here yeah. that's why perhaps cgm has been very useful and how much time in the entire day spend, are you spending in normal range is so important you know and you're not shifting out of the normal range so we know that conventional say 70 to 180 is should be and 70% of the time you should be yes. within the time in range and below range has been defined above range has been defined yes. and you know that helps us to at least get a picture about the glycemic status and i think all these monitorings complement each other in one way or the other so while time in range hba1c point of care testing all of them are useful in the information that they provide us 
but I think they all complement. One can't substitute for the other in any sort of way. So it would be fallacious to say that I don't want to do point of care testing. I just want everybody to be on CGMs, right? So there is a cost factor involved into Absolutely. it. The the interpretation is so important. Training of interpretation and reacting to that interpretation is so important. So all this becomes a very major sort of you know determinant. While people who are not very familiar with technology or not very conversant with you know how to go about the CGM, point of care testing still remains a very important tool for monitoring. Only thing is I advise them do more frequently rather than just stick on to two times a day. And capturing the postprandial hyperglycemia becomes so much easier on a CGM and you can actually see where the graphs are headed in any kind of way. So I completely agree with you. The sense I'm getting from you is that the whole spectrum of glycemia is like a tapestry jigsaw. So you have fasting blood sugar, you have the postprandial blood sugar, you have HbA1c, you have the time in range, you have time above range, time below range, so many other matrices. But maybe postprandial hyperglycemia occupies a special and important position in that jigsaw uh, to complete the spectrum of diabetes care. And as I said, treatment should be individualized. What are your thoughts sir, on all the things we discussed today? I think it's been a very uh, fruitful discussion, very in sort of uh, uh, interaction of thoughts. And I think there is a lot of commonality in what we both think. And this should actually govern the way people yes. should treat diabetes. So while the West keeps talking about target the fasting, and if you see all the earlier guidelines, they were just talking about fasting glucose and A1Cs. Nobody really put the stress on postprandial hyperglycemia. Till we realized that postprandial glycemia is an equally important yes. determinant of you know control, not only control and of A1C lowering but also determinant of macro macrovascular complications. And if you see extending to that, today even postprandial lipemia is considered more important yes. for cardiovascular risk. It's not just postprandial hyperglycemia. So, if entirely, if you look at it in entirety now, we have moved away from just glycemic lowering to give them additional benefits in terms of cardiovascular risk, stroke risk, peripheral vascular risk, all the, you know, risk yeah, involved. Sure. And targeting the obesity, targeting the cardiovascular risk, targeting the glycemia, targeting the blood pressures, all have become important factors. And we know that a typical patient of diabetes will have all this, Absolutely. you know, conundrum that they go along with. And the major role of postprandial hyperglycemia or postprandial is got in all these situations where lipemia and all these things are important for cardiovascular risk. What you eat is yes. what you get. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think in that sense, uh, hyperglycemia is, as you said, one one aspect. There is hyperlipidemia, there is weight maintenance, there is cardiovascular risk. So all these have to be maintained. And India is a country where, you know, diabetes is so common, it affects uh, people of all ages. Maybe. It doesn't respect any state boundaries, affects the well-off and the poor. So the sheer magnificence of a disease like diabetes uh, coexist with routine problems we see on the field like affordability, accessibility, availability. So I think we are on the same pace that we need to individualize therapy so that people with diabetes can get better. Absolutely. Right. Nice so meeting up with you. Pleasure is a pleasure meeting with you and great fun. Let's catch up again yes, for some more talks. Yes, sir. some more discussions. Hello friends, I'm Dr. Rajiv Kovil and today you are Dr. Unni Krishnan as well as Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, two top metabolic physicians and diabetologists from Pune who took you around Pune and spoke about a very important topic. They spoke about postprandial hyperglycemia, its impact on cardiovascular disease, and also they, they, they alluded to time and range, which is a huge powerful tool. And today I'm going to just summarize what is all about postprandial hyperglycemia. So when we speak about postprandial hyperglycemia, whether you are from North India, South India, Western or East India, we eat a lot, a lot of carbs. We are a carbohydrate eating population and almost 80 to 85 percent of our energy intake in many parts of India come from carbs. That's what the starch study also told us. And this is accompanied by a huge amount of postprandial lipemia. A lot of studies have linked postprandial hyperglycemia and cardiovascular disease. The Honolulu study, the Hoon study, Decode study to name a few. And postprandial hyperglycemia and cardiovascular disease, whether it's the impact of postprandial blood glucose on the endothelium, 
postprandial lipemia which which also accompanies postprandial hyperglycemia we still don't have our answers to that but the decode study clearly showed that at every quartile of postprandial hyperglycemia the chances of cardiovascular disease increases which means that as the quartiles of 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 postprandial blood sugars go up the impact on the endothelium increases and your chances of cardiovascular disorders increases that's why we need to control postprandial hyperglycemia and if if you look at data from the monier data monier data what was the monier data monier data was all about whether the relative contribution of fasting and pp to hba1c and if you look at it when the hba1c is high around 11% the the contribution of fasting is 70% and when you can come down to 7% the contribution of postprandial is almost 70% so if you want to get a patient from 11 to probably 9 control is fasting but if you want to get him from 9 to a target level of 7 you need to put postprandial regulators this was also evident in the data which came from south asia by wang and all which said that at every hba1c postprandial contribution is very high so for asian indians if you want to get them to targets it's extremely important we get postprandial down with a lot of postprandial regulators as such so what are the management of anti diabetic drugs when you look at postprandial hyperglycemia well uh, the intratent based therapies come very very high whether they are glp1 or dpp4 inhibitors they come very very high as far as postprandial goes another very important group of drug which unfortunately the westerners don't use probably because of gi side effects is the alpha glucosidase inhibitors alpha glucosidase inhibitors have emerged as a wonderful tool to take care or a wonderful group of drugs to take care of postprandial hyperglycemia and whether it's a it's an acarbos or a voglibos both work very very well and this blunting of postprandial hyperglycemia could have a lot of benefit on our endothelium as well another group of drugs which works very well in postprandial hyperglycemia is the glenides in the glenides you have the only glenide which is available today is repaglenide you also have combinations of repaglenide and voglibo this can be a very effective combination especially in people who have postprandial hyperglycemia where we are not using any any other secretagogue also in patients with chronic kidney disease so postprandial hyperglycemia is very cl- clearly linked to cardiovascular disease and it's essential that we target postprandial blood sugars with one of these agents if this is not possible then we need need to require a prandial insulin which could be an insulin analog which is added on top of a basal insulin or a premix insulin to make sure that the postprandials are under control thank you all for a patient hearing and we'll get back to you again with one of the top two or probably two top kos exploring another city thank you all